So today is my great pleasure uh, to, to introduce uh, Toby G from Imperial, and Toby will speak about the Ramanujan conjecture. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, <laughs> Pleasure to be giving a, a talk at Chicago again. And uh, this is joint. Eventually, I'm using the Canoe Bridge, but eventually, you've got the Ethereum at the end, which is joint with uh, George Boxer. So, like that, used to be here. Frank Kanagari, who's still here. <laughs> and James Newton. So the theorem will be at the end. Um, so I'm going to start by going right back to um, what the Brahman conjecture is. And it comes from a paper from in 1916, which did several things. One thing he did was uh, define a uh, sequence of integers to power of n by the following equation. Uh, this is the kind of a, power, a formal power theory expansion, right? Um, of the following infinite product as an one minus e to the n. This is the oh, I'll talk about this, this function. I have another name in a, in a bit. So this is just finding a sequence of integers. You just multiply this out, and you give these to the t. Um, Quite a few values and explains in this paper how to kind of somewhat efficiently compute by hand. So it's not easy to um, And of course, I should know these, but I don't. So not a real number theory. So we write out the first two characters 1472 g4 four, uh, plus 4830 g5 and it's just zero and four eight. Two to the six, and we got like, some sequence of integers, some positive, some negative, and they're growing reasonably quickly. Okay, so he made uh, a number of conjectures. So the first couple are not the ones thought of unreasonably conjectures, three conjectures. Um, but one conjecture he made. All right. Phrase it like this. Consider following uh, infinite sum of power of n over n to the s, maybe you can think of this s as like an informal thing or maybe it's a real or complex number, like a, a sufficiently large real number, for example, would be enough. And you can get this function, this theory is equal to the following product, the product over t prime of one over one minus power of t e to the minus x uh, plus e to the uh, 11 minus t. Okay, so that was his conjecture. That's the first one, not the one of the title of this talk, but I'll come back shortly. Um, if you're not an adversary, if you haven't seen it like this before, there's, there's some kind of natural motivation for this, which is to compare to. What happens in the Riemann Zeta function? So the Riemann Zeta function is the same kind of sum, but just with one instead of power of n. And this, if you like, makes sense for complex number of this real part bigger than one, or real numbers x bigger than one, and then converted. But this is equal to uh, kind of similar infinite product in the Prime to t, but just one over one minus t to the minus x. Um, so this is called an Euler product. Yes, by Euler, uh, in some form. And so why is why is this equation true? Uh, well, the point is, do you think of this term here as the uh, as the answer to some kind of geometric progression? Well, the point is that this product over prime one over one minus T to the minus S is um, product of some one over one plus one to the S, but one over T to the two S, and so on. And then we have this explicitly sort of right out, T 
because they're first letter. Two snacks and a full snack. So I'm not. And then. Here's the act. Nine's the act. That's wrong. And of course, if I start multiplying this out, I'll be back my x's just about like five. Or the first four. Uh, what happens? We get like one, one over two to the x, one over three to the x, and then one over two times three to the x, and one over I mean, four is two times two. Yeah, actually, I'm doing this in some slightly funny order, but the point is, you can see as you multiply this out, we're going to get all possible prime factorizations. And so this uh, this formula is just equivalent to unique factorization. So this is this is why this kind of thing is true. And I think I mean Robin Luke didn't just suck this out of nowhere. I have to confess I'm gonna learn much of his story, but I can see that this is other kind of similar functions that also have these kind of other two questions that we natural can suggest. And well, just as this this formula is equivalent to unique factorization, having a formula like this obviously must be telling you something about these numbers power then. And so this conjecture is equivalent to so this we have to call this star for a second. So star is equivalent to asking at least on this kind of formal level, and I haven't said that either of these sides kind of converge this with the algorithm, but just on the level of multiplying things out, equivalent to the, the following two properties. First of all, that uh, if M and N are co prime, so they have no common factors. Uh, then we're just asking them how M times N is how then power then. So the reason I would just rather choose the six is so you could have some non trivial examples. So you do some multiplied minus twenty four by twenty fifty two. Minus six thousand forty-eight. So you have some numerical evidence, and that's an example. But also, you need something for the case where they're not co-prime. So you need something about prime powers, and that says the powers. So T is always going to be a prime in this sort. You don't stop saying that. This is how to be. This is one um, minus. P to the 11, P to the K minus P. So this is where P is prime. Okay. So it's just two kind of very concrete uh, predictions about the behavior of these, these numbers in a more particular sense. But it's not at all clear from this definition here, like you can't, I think, just make some kind of combinatorial. Uh, so there's no kind of easy combinatorial way to do this. There are, there are arguments. This is not this is the delicacy in the next uh, On the other hand, it was literally proved that, and I'm not sure quite how quickly, but the published paper is from 1917, the model in 1917, proved uh, proved basically the problem. So, I think it was more or less instant. I'll say something a little about the proof in a few minutes. The revolution also made a further conjecture, which is one way of thinking about it is predicting in particular that uh, this, this theory does actually converge if x is sufficiently large. So to know that kind of thing, you need to know some bounds to be one two. And of course, in view of these uh, formulas here, bounding these quantities ultimately comes down to bounding the values. So you need to kind of have some kind of bound for those. And then the kind of the thing that's actually known as the revolution conjecture. The two generalizations that we get from the paper. conjecture. Um, it's from the same paper there, he conjectures that for all primes p, uh, this is bounded by three times p to the 11 on two. So I think he had at least two motivations for thinking this should be true. I mean, one is he kind of broke this function down, at least the way he, he talks about it in a slightly indirect way, as he kind of 
finds this is some error sending some other calculation between some other functions where he does have some bounds. And so he gets a bound, I think, like um, maybe p to the eight or maybe p to the seven, I don't quite remember. So he, he kind of knows through some other reasons that there is some kind of formula about, and then you can also see from the numbers that it's not the best. Uh, but the other motivation is, is by thinking about this, this quantity here. So if you write, if you try and kind of, it looks like some kind of quadratic, or it is a quadratic in p to the minus s. And so if you factor it, You write this as uh, one minus alpha p e to the and then going to two minus x one minus e to p e to the left maybe two minus x. Then, well, of course, tau p is now the sum of these two quantities, and so this conjecture, uh, this unusual conjecture, is equivalent to asking that alpha p plus beta p is, and these are just two complex numbers, they probably, it's sum that makes two. And if you think about it, since also if you multiply this out, then the, the product alpha p beta p equals one. So I can rephrase this. As the conjecture that the conjecture is that these complex numbers don't have uh, absolute value. Which, whereas this thing is slightly odd, this, this at least kind of seems like a nice drop one thing. And of course, he's able to check this conjecture for a long time to see. Yeah, so this conjecture is also known. This is proved by the lead. I'm not quite sure when again, I'm going to get my date, but in the late 1960s. Um, and as a consequence, was a part of this proof of the, not an immediate consequence, but alongside this proof of the basic thing. And as far as I know, this is the only proof still to this day. So there's, and there's some kind of massive difference in difficulty between this conjecture here that was resolved instantly, and then this one that took 50 years and it's still kind of hard to Any questions so far? Okay, so I'm going to say the tiniest amount about Mondale's proof, or rather about the sort of more modern interpretation of Luther Hecker. Again, I just don't know, if, I don't think Hecker was literally really interpreting Mondale, but on the other hand, his, what he's what I'm about to say is basically some kind of abstraction of what Mondale does. If you do this using, you can see the argument that. In common, um, but I'm embarrassed that I didn't look this up enough so you can know what is literally following him. So, as, as Robert Newton said, he knew, um, and as Mordell used this kind of series expansion here, we can really actually think of it as an actual function, not just as some kind of formal variable p. So, let's define uh, h and kind of calligraphic h to be the complex upper half plane. So the complex numbers were in the Maguire part with the zero. And then I write for such a, a complex number, let's get the uh, Q to be e to the two pi well, sorry again, e to the two pi i squared. So if I do that and substitute into it, this is then just some very expansion of function. So the kind of Ramanujan delta function is by definition literally this function. So the function I define above the series power of n q to the n. But now q is as a function of z. So this is a function of z. So this is some polymorphic function on this upper half plane. Okay. 
And in, as probably many of you know, this is an example of a So the Delta bed is in fact a cuspidal, or it's saying what we were meaning in a second, a cuspidal modular form. Of weight 12. Indeed, this 12 has something to do with 24 up there and, and with the 11. That's a more general theory of modular forms of other weights, and then there's analogs of all these kind of well. There's not necessarily an analog of that product, but there's an analog of this conjecture of Ramanujan, where the weight replaces the weight minus one and so on. But I'm just going to stick to this concrete example. So anyway, what does this what does this mean? Uh, so it means that um, well, it's the function has to some properties. So the first kind of property is kind of trivial uh, because it's a function of this variable q, and obviously q is unchanged if I add one to z because this is the i i one. Uh, it's invariant under adding one. So the kind of less much less obvious property. Again, I think you, you will struggle to prove just by some formal information is that if I replace z with minus one over z, which is still something in the upper half plane, because it makes sense, this is equal to z to the 12. Okay. And um, sorry. <laughs> so these are these are kind of examples of Möbius transformations. Or having one doing this, and you can think about the group generated by these these operations. And mm -hmm. this is actually equivalent to the property of that uh, delta of a z plus b over b z plus b is b z plus b to the twelve delta of z. Um, for all matrices any B, B, D, uh, in the group SL2Z. So what's the group SL2Z if you haven't seen it? Uh, it's just these four entries have to be integers and the determinant has to be one. A, B, B, D, Z, and A, B, D, is one. So this is some kind of fun exercise. You can check uh, that this group here is generated by you know, these two operations. And you can check that you know, this property implies this property here. It's like it's the next round of okay, so that's that's some definition of a modular form of weight 12, the 12 occurring here. And there's this word cuspidal, which has various ways of putting it. And the one that's convenient for me is I want to say the following cuspidal. Mean that uh, delta of z times b. I'm going to write it's like only imaginary part of z. Look at it. Sorry, it's terrible board work. Cuspidal uh, means that this function here is bounded on the cuspidal function. And so, for this specific example, where I told you it's the function. Oh, it's, it's, the reason it's very easy to, to check that this is true because if you think about what's happening and you know that like that gets very big, um, these powers of Q are decaying exponentially. And so that's without writing polynomials. This may not be the definition of Medu if you've seen what we've talked about before, but the point is that this thing, this quantity here, another kind of fun exercise using this. Is that this quantity here is now also in, is completely unchanged if I make these substitutions? Think about how the actual part of that changes when I put one of these matrices and remember that condition is determined with one. This is about a, this is, sorry, it's an invariant function, and then the usual definition of custodality uh, means that it's, it's going to be bounded if you put on the morphic function on some mass. Anyway, we can take that as a definition. <laughs> So, if this is the definition of possible modular forms of weight 12, then the kind of this is easy to check for this delta. This is completely easy. And then this is the thing that's a bit serious, but it's also kind of 
19th century potato people didn't know how to do this. Okay, so I'm especially telling you what uh, what Hackett did. What did Hackett do? So again, I'm going to kind of skip to this this example of emotional form of weight twelve, but really this theory extends. Uh, you can have any positive integer weight. And you can also, instead of considering this group, you can consider things like finite index subgroups and things like that. I'm not going to do that explicitly in the talk, but that's a kind of more general theory of modular forms. So Hacker constructed so, constructed certain Yeah. Um, basis of modular forms. What do I mean by spaces of modular forms? Well, I've written down some condition. Um, so I wrote down some condition on some function here, and. If I multiply this function delta by any uh, complex number, it's still satisfied. And if I had another function that satisfied the same things and added them together, that would also be an example of this. So really, there's some complex vector space of functions satisfying these conditions. And as I said, really, I could also do this with well the trace by thinking that. So there's some kind of space of these things. It's, it's not hard to show it's a finite dimensional space. Um, and the what are these, these things called? For each integer and equation to one, there's some kind of central operator it's called. Yeah, you call them what they do. And it's defined by uh, some kind of averaging uh, new uh, values. Um, Z, we've translated by certain matrices A, B, C, D. Um, to say, you've got to solve the direction of the problem. So he takes, you have this kind of invariance property um, under um, these, these integer value things with the kernel of one, but you instead move slightly outside that regime. Obviously you don't have any invariance anymore, but you can do some averaging over some finite kind of set of translates and get back to something that's still satisfied as well. So I'm not going to define them properly, but um, kind of it's immediate from the definition. That uh, TM, TM is TM N if M and N are co-prime. And that T of T to the K uh, is T of T if T to the K minus one, sorry, yeah, K minus one, uh, minus T to the eleven. Which convenient, I still have these things on the board here, which is exactly these kind of relations. And so, in kind of Pecker's language, Mordell's proof, all you have to show is that um, following, you can show that these that this delta function is an eigenvector. These with eigenvalues. So if you can show this, then it's immediate from these relations uh, that we can solve. And how can you do this? Well, it turns out that it's not so hard to compute the dimensions of these spaces. 
current dimensional space of these things. And in fact, in this case, you can show the dimension is one. So you now have that automatically when you apply these operators, you must get some gain of multiple of the original thing. And in fact, you can also then just compute um, from the definition of these things very explicitly what they do just as a very expansion. So you get this just by basically sort of plugging in the definition. It's not hard to do. Okay, so, so this is kind of how Hecker is sort of interpreted this kind of calculation. And it's, as I say, basically what Morgan did as well. So, kind of one reason I was mentioning as well, A, kind of to kind of explain there's some structure behind this thing. But B, it turns out that I'm going to kind of mention various generalizations of Ramanujan's conjecture. And the thing that generalizes is actually not so much this interpretation of these numbers and Fourier coefficients, coefficients of powers of Q, but this interpretation that they are eigenvalues of small operators. Okay, well, there's also another thing that kind of hacked it, which I think, again, was, I think this was already known in this, this Delta case, but it sort of did a sort of general version of it, he proved something towards, um, towards this, uh, this actual one we can get to on, on this bound. There's something called the hacker bound. Which is that, um, well, in fact, it applies for all n. He shows, he shows that part n is at most uh, some constant times n equals six. So for some, some constant c bigger than zero, but independent of that, of course. So it's, of course, not doing the amount of two, so it's not so very far away. Um, and let me just kind of give you the full details in a very quick sketch. So you actually use this property here that this quantity is bounded. So it's kind of proof of this bound. Right exactly by y. And then use that. Um, that you actually value in y to the fifth delta of z is bounded. So maybe let's just say that this is less than c prime to some c prime to c zero. And then you just use um, usual kind of Fourier analysis technique to extract this one coefficient. So how can you do that? And um, the following quality. And y is equal to the integral zero to one, right? Delta x plus y y uh, minus two pi times n x to x. So this is just usual Fourier theory. I'm just everything else, all the other terms in the series cancel out. And now, of course, this is bounded by um, by c prime. Six by this inequality here, which I said to be the bounded by this c y to the minus six, six c by y to the minus six here, which is bounded by one. And now just take uh, take y to the one over n, and then you get this solution where c by is multiplied by like c to the two pi. So this is kind of this is this, this hacker bound. Just a consequence of this kind of elementary condition. Uh, and there were various improvements on this in the following years. I mean, this is sometime in the 1920s, 1940s. Rankin managed to improve this to uh, like six minus a fifth, I think. And there were a few other improvements, but, um, but nothing until the lean of actually what's happening to the actual state. So I think there's no sort of reasonable. Hope of, of doing it just by, by analysis. Okay, so I'll show you one more thing. 
about generalization, which is very brief. So there is something I could call the generalized Ramanujan conjecture, something very general. I won't talk about, but I'll say something in between. Kind of modern, maybe meaning 1960s, 70s, and cases. So with modular forms, Uh, certain polymorphic functions in the upper half plane. And kind of a sort of curious at first sight way to write this upper half plane is again by using memory functions. So if instead of having my matrices be integer coefficients by allowing them to be any real numbers, then the Mobius transformation that uh, act transitively. I can think about the ones that fix phi, for example, that's the special orthogonal group that provides this equation. And so I can think instead that these are some kind of functions on this equation. And then from that, it's kind of natural to like generalize the kind of automorphic forms. For example, on the characters like SLM or things like that. So and I can start replacing this with other groups, and there are many theories of these things. Um, but in particular, if I there's some kind of complete theory of these things that I'm not going to discuss, but there's a generalization for them of things like the Peck operators and so on. And in particular, attached to, to these things, you can attach some numbers like the alpha p's and eta p's. In particular, you can attach what are called Sakaki parameters. And uh, if I'm doing an n dimensional one, then so it kind of turns out that you can't quite do it for all primes, but for all the finite many primes, the associated to one of these classical symbolic forms, or more, uh, more precisely, one that's an eigen form, uh, an eigen vector piece, these hegel operators, you attach uh, now n numbers. <coughs> I'm going to set the notation was alpha p1 alpha p n. So this is just a generalization of my idea called alpha beta, but obviously that's worked so well for n of them. And then the, the conjecture, the generalized Ramanujan conjecture, is that if you have a possible smorphic representation for the PLN, um, then these quantities satisfy that exact same thing that the all of these things have up to value exactly one. And again, you do also know when you speak to and normalize it that the product is going to be as a as a value one. So I'm going to state kind of results towards this conjecture as upper bounds on them. If you have an upper bound on all these quantities, and you know the product, then you also have a lower bound. So in some sense, if you prove, if you prove that all of these were at most one, you would say the product. So this is completely open. Um, there's what's called the trivial bound. Which is basically kind of the same kind of argument as the Hecker thing, which you can show that um, by a generalization of this kind of argument, that these quantities are big error, or need to be n minus one over two. So, again, the, the relationship between these, these powers and, and these numbers is there's some normalization there by a factor of uh, p to the 11 on. Two, so that's why I'm going to get half here rather than six. So you're trying to get this down to be one, of course, when it's n is bigger than one, this is too big. And kind of there have been various improvements in this, but again, it's, it's completely open in general. So it's uh, something that we're going to use later. You can try to learn this later in 1981. They proved. You can make an improvement on this for uh, all n bigger than all n bigger than two. They showed that uniformly for any n, 
the point is that most when well, so that n equals two, that's no better than this, but that n equals three and so on, it's getting a lot better. Um, there are better bands than this. I think the best band in general is uh, your own Rudnick and Sarnak can prove this. Um, you can subtract off an unsteady test part in general. That's the, that's the best sound. Uh, that's not what the jacket type is. You know, I'll try to do that again. But um, so in particular, for large n, you're doing a little bit better than feet to the half, but not that much better, and nowhere near feet to zero. Okay, so let me move slightly closer to present day and just explain uh, Langland's strategy for uh, trying to prove this, this generalized Ramanujan conjecture um, without having to do sort of more analysis, um, without having to improve these bounds, find some kind of way around using this bound, bounds like this, to get the full conjecture. So this is based on this is strategy from uh, the late 60s, written up in 1970. He proposed a whole kind of general picture, uh, part of which is from a special case of what's called the Langham correspondence. And that consists of conjectural projection between uh, the following things. Um, I'm going to put in brackets algebraic, hospital, uh, automorphic uh, representations. Of TLM. So I've changed forms to representations, but if you don't know about this, you can ignore that. This is just some generalization of modular forms. And there's going to be some triangles that connect trajectories in all directions to the same things. Down here is what are called uh, kind of irreducible uh, and motive. So some things in algebraic geometry, I'll say, I'll talk more about this in a minute. Um, and then over here, there's actually going to be a solid arrow, and there's a dotted arrow down here. And these are going to be um, certain L Abbott Savoir representations. So don't worry if you don't know what any of these things mean. I'm going to be doing some schematic. So uh, let me just kind of ignore issues of coefficients. So these are kind of representations of the absolute Galvin of Q, that n dimensional representation. Reducible, but that's not too much about that. And the only arrow that's filled in is this is a theory of the path and on. I'll give you an example that's a bit more concrete to all of this going. But so this was kind of conjectured and, and in fact much more general things than this was conjectured by Langland in the 60s. And this is still basically completely open. Um, but actual modular forms, the kind of most basic case, it's reasonably close to being filled in, but that's basically the only case that is. Uh, and in general, this is extremely difficult. Um, what are these? I should just say, like, how these bijections kind of actually forms the kind of the dotted uh, arrows as well as how do you relate objects. They're also to be related by these L functions, which we've already seen an example of. So, uh, kind of compatibility is by using the L function. Easily, for some people, L function of delta, which is just a thing I wrote down at the very beginning, the sum of tau then with n to the So you can make these kind of things in general. The way you make them for these things is some kind of one of these Euler products involved in these things called alpha ti, which will make you find them. 
and the ways you make it for these things, or these, these motives are um, much more concrete than these would be algebraic varieties, solutions to algebraic equations over the rational. And there you get kind of quantities by counting the number of points on these modular various primes. And similarly over here, you get them by sort of thinking about the processes of the Venus elements and so on. So in each case, there's some kind of natural way of getting some numbers that look like examples of the eyes. And concretely, you're saying that these there's something called an L function, you're also saying they're the same thing, but um, even more explicitly, you've got some there's some way of extracting numbers like these alpha PIs in each setting, and you're saying that those are the same. So there's some kind of more explicit way of comparing here. Um, and so yeah, let me just uh, maybe I should give myself a whole board. So let me sort of give the <laughs> <laughs> I once when I was an undergraduate did something like that to down. <laughs> that might be the first time I've told them. Did you write some already? <laughs> something uh, more dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so kind of the example of, of this is actually the one example where this kind of thing really exists is uh, kind of weight to. Modular form. So I just had a weight 12 modular form before, but there's Newton weight 2. Um, maybe call this form F. There's an arrow down here from the 1960s due to uh, Isaac Kimura, which um, takes it to an elliptic curve. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the kind of what's called the elastic tape module of the F is this more concrete thing. If you seem to report some of this concerns, you'll know something about this. Um, and this goes to some kind of two-dimensional uh, Gauss equation. And here, this is kind of almost. We should be slightly fuzzy on this, but this is almost a filled in arrow due to a uh, work of Wiles, Taylor, uh, Royce, and Matt, Simon Taylor, uh, various people, and then at least a couple of people who from Chicago, connections Mark Sisson and Murray Pan, I think are maybe the most recent names I would put here. Seems like a people like Corey and Dentenberger and so on. So we kind of always have a complete picture here. Uh, the various versions here are the statement that elliptic curves are modular. So I'm saying and you can go to start anywhere and chase it around. So you go here to here to here, and you take an elliptic curve and you make a modular form, and that's what Wiles is proving with the other machinery suggested. It's like the map up here. But unfortunately, this is kind of the only case where I can really fill in a diagram like that with all space in general. It's in the open. Okay, so. So how did Berlin use this picture? I mean, I'm not sure he literally used it, this picture, but this was around the same time. I think there's roughly some sort of motivation on each side. He has Delta over here, this modular form, and he constructed some kind of motive, some, some kind of piece of cohomology of the variety down here associated with that by a piece of Tarkis construction. And then he proved the Bayes conjectures, which is some bound on numbers of points point count for varieties, and that bound is exactly the unusual conjecture of Delta. So it's exactly the same statement. So he translated it into algebraic geometry and then uh, and then proved the statement. And and the the Bay conjectures in his proof that's completely general. So one way you could just try and use this is now if you could construct this arrow, you would win. So like any any time you can go from here to here, you're done because the Bay conjectures are literally equivalent to the unusual. But unfortunately, we can hardly ever do this. So it turns out, and this is maybe kind of after the fact from, from Langland's point of view, but Langland's kind of proposed a way that instead you could use this direction, which is a lot weaker. It turns out it's a lot easier to construct our representations than to construct motives. And so what was what was Langland's idea? So let me just tell you what Langland's idea was just in the context. 
of the original so the naive idea is that, and it may not be obvious, but this is everything here is extremely different. And these are solutions for some PDEs, pretty much, and these are something coming much more from number theory. There's no obvious reason that you could disconnect them. And some, some things which are very easy for one of these things are very hard on the other side. Did you observe that there are kind of easy things you can use for conditions that are very non obvious here? So he goes there, imagine you have this. So then you would take your modular form, you say you have to take delta, you would associate to it what I call rho delta with two dimensional representation. L. And then he said, well, you can actually do a bunch of things to representation. You can kind of take sums of them, you can take tensor products and so on. And in particular, you can take the symmetric powers of them. So this is now a representation of GLN QL. And that's now one of these girl representations. Now you know, we've gone from n equals two to n to n. So if you believe this, you should be able to go back up to here. And so this should, you know, the conjecture, but then this should, this should correspond to uh, an alternative form. And you can then ask, well, what if I look at the kind of bounds I have for things for GLN? Get help of all. And it turns out that yes, because we started for GL2, we had these numbers like this alpha D, alpha D and beta D. And if you go to GLN, it turns out the numbers you get are analogous to N numbers, and it turns out I get a very straightforward linear algebra. So I, I just get all of these forms to be alpha D to the I to the beta D to the J. I think I was more than an hour, so it's going to be exhausted at the end. Let's see how many bytes I've got. Great, n minus two, n minus one. Okay, so those are the quantities I get. But now if we stare at this bound here, we can see something really good has happened because this tells us that alpha three to the n minus one and b to the n minus one are most or less than. Uh, P to the half square root of P. And so now, of course, I can just take n minus first roots and let n go to infinity, and I can clearly see the bound of the by one. But I also told you that if the product of them is one, then that's what you have one there. So all you have to do is show that this operation is valid, that you can go back from this any dimensional thing to here, and then you can win. And you didn't ever have to use the data. I should also say that, I mean, again, I don't really understand the history, but there is actually a step in um, interleaved proof of the basic justice which uses an idea that's quite like this. Um, he said he was motivated by the work of Rankin and not earlier, although possibly I think he was also motivated by the person. Yes, I'm trying to smooth over that point of contention. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure anyone quite knows the issue. Okay, so. We're into the last 10 minutes, so I should actually try and debate the theorem. Mm. So, you take that to be an imaginary quadratic field. So, for example, you could say F to be the complex numbers that are just rational combinations of one and I, nearby, without being theoretical. Um, that is consistent like this. 
um, or any other whatever your favorite metrics on the field is, more generally, you must just like take any CN field. Um, there's a notion of modular uh, forms here yeah, as well. Um, I'm going to write I mean, it all needs to be concise, so it's going to. And I can actually call these hacker operators uh, where you can pay at two. Then there's, uh, and if I was doing the CM field case, I would say parallel weights, okay, these two. And then there's a notion of this revolution you get from this world as well. And it's very similar to what we say. And so there are theorems that allegory, me, and Newton. Is that the revolution can get for us? Holds for all, um, it's called Yankee modular forms. So this builds on an earlier theorem, previously. Thinking about 2018, the table two was proved by see if I can get written down the acronym for the or first of all, see if I can down the So it's Alan, Aligari, Tariani, me, Elm, uh, Alahom, Newton again, Doctor, Kayon, Thor. <laughs> I think that's called the 10 author paper because you can be an author. It's a little dangerous to try and get the authors in that type of paper. Uh, so, so, we proved this about five years ago. And I think this is the first time that something like Langham's strategy was implemented because we don't have this arrow here. Uh, you kind of hope that there might be something that makes it a bit curves or something, but we don't have a clue how to do that. We do have. Kind of arrow this way in this setting by working with Peter Schultzer. Um, so you can kind of do the first step of taking a modular form or making a representation associated to it. And then you want to do this step of taking symmetric powers. And then you just have to go back again. And unfortunately, we also don't know how to go back again at all. But there's something called uh, potential modularity. Yeah, the famous from the mid-1990s. The somewhat robust method for showing not that this representation itself comes from a multiple form, but it does if I kind of shrink a bit, if I, if I pass this on the front of you. So there exists a kind of a metal field F prime over F. So for each N, there is a system like this that the restriction of This is now the F prime injection. Um, two bar F prime is modular at the bottom of this. And it turns out that this is still enough. I mean, this is actually turns out that this question is exactly the same as if I could have, uh, it turns out, doing it essentially, this is what happens. This question is so that's what we managed to do with this table two paper. So now just for actual number theory, so I'm going to make one remark about what we knew. Because the way this potential modularity method works is it relies on finding points on some modulized spaces. And you basically need to write down modulized spaces of motives that look somewhat like the kind of things you're trying to prove. A modular. And in this kind of rank n case, it turns out you always work with something called the dwarf parameters. And this works extremely well in this weight two case, and it doesn't work at all uh, if the weights are bigger. So it's basically some Griffith Trans Society problem. You can't do this. There's kind of known techniques to do this. And what we do is uh, kind of for input from any n, but maybe that's not well on this, we show that each of each n, we choose. Curve. 
p sub n. And so the following thing is modular. So the m minus the power of this representation that we tensor it with the a minus second power of the modulus of the curve. So that this is potentially modular. So it's kind of an easy exercise. If you want to this to see that this is enough, given what I've already said, because basically you kind of know the phase trajectory of the uh, revolution trajectory for this thing, and that is enough to do all of this thing. Uh, doing this solves the kind of this, this problem I mentioned of not having big enough families of motors. And then it turns out, I mean, this idea, uh, I know I mean, Frank first suggested this idea about five years ago. Uh, it solves a lot of problems, but we also need some new modularity lifting theorem. Uh, for that, we have a, a new argument using uh, some very recent work of Carl and Newton, where they prove that these open general compatibility. And we also have a, a kind of fun argument using uh, these stacks of big L modules for that line, which is first. Uh, I think it's dead on the force, so I'll stop there. Are there any questions? This is a historical point. I, I wasn't aware of this thing. Like, I think it's paper Model, you know, like why we call them okay operators, like did you not quite well, you know, like, like he didn't quite his language is more like he just broke down the functions you get by <laughs> and yeah, so he didn't sort of have this abstraction of the equation to very exactly understood it, so much more concrete. It keeps a lot of value. Just a small remark. It, uh, uh, when the Lee proved the implication of Bay conjecture, Lumen and Lewin conjecture, the Bay conjecture were not proved yet. He did that five years later. Uh -huh. yeah. I think it's okay. just 50 years ago. So. Okay. Yeah. A little bit more about the same k minus two yeah. I mean the point of the point of this is just to make the width of kind of posh numbers of this like zero, one, two, some consecutive number. Because this has kind of gaps, zero, k minus one, and so on. So this, this fills in kind of gaps. This if I've got the numerology correct. The problem is how to find the beach curve. Yeah, it's actually easy to find the elliptic curve. We also have to do a bunch of tricks to make sure it's like Ordinarily at the right place with the super singular and so on, but it's kind of easy to find the lifting curve. I mean, we're allowed to, in this business, make the number feel bigger, so it's kind of easy to write down the lifting curve. So, in some sense, the hard thing is, well, having the kind of theorem to take us through, the techniques there, and then actually proving the modularity lifting theorem was what we were stuck on for a few years. And then we came back to it and realized we actually had all the pieces after all. My understanding is it's basically that it's writing cell work method, and it's basically a, a complete identical version of that. So, in fact, all it's being used is as a global thing with global generic, and it's looking like we're just never completely used as a global generic. It's much, much softer. And it wasn't, it didn't exist when Langer made it over against the body of the argument, which is like ranking. The ranking argument I could just say was. About considering um, the functions of power n squared over MCS. So, ranking can consider this, and was able to show this has some deep generalizing properties and produce a bound in this. And in some sense, uh, this, this Langman suggestion is, is more like just replacing this with an arbitrary. Uh, if you can control these functions sufficiently well analytically for all to L, then you have a recovery more bound. Well, the words I'm doing still work as long as you can fill it in and my right, right. I mean, his argument is more like just some, yeah, something more, more closely 